Good. <clears throat> this speech will be a little bit different than uh, some of the other speeches we've had today. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the Internet of Things. Uh, however, uh, it is consistent with the theme of uh, information driven. I'm going to talk about the information that's involved in asset lifecycle management. So first I'll talk about the, uh, who's standing in front of the uh, projector? Oh, somebody's behind the screen. Okay, I'll point over here. Uh, I'll, first, I'll talk about asset, the, the definition of uh, what I mean by asset lifecycle information management. Then we did a little survey, that's a little dry. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the financial impact and why the C-suite should be interested in this. Uh, could you advance the slide for me? Thank you. So uh, this is my favorite uh, asset in the world. Uh, I haven't gotten around to India much, so uh, maybe there's some better ones in India, but I like to talk about the, ah, thank you. Helps if you turn it on. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Brooklyn Bridge in, in talking about asset lifecycle information management. Uh, the Brooklyn Bridge, they started building it in 1870. Uh, I know that's uh, not very old compared to structures in, in India, but that's very, very old for the average uh, structure in the United States. Started building in 1870, finished it in 1883. It opened in May, so there was a 13 year design and build cycle, and now it's been in operation for 130 years. Now, the point of this is that when that was completed in 1883, the automobile hadn't been invented yet. The main purpose of the Brooklyn Bridge was to allow people in Brooklyn to get to Manhattan so they could work in the factories that are in Manhattan. Well, obviously a lot's changed in 130 years. There aren't any factories in Manhattan anymore. And the, and the primary mode of transportation was the promenade, which is pictured here on top. And below that, there were three lanes in each direction. When it was first built, there was a lane for a cable car another lane for horse and buggy, and a third lane just for horses. Now, obviously a lot of change occurred in 130 years. So there was project after project to upgrade the Brooklyn Bridge, so that now the main transportation is the three lanes in each direction, and of course is three lanes of cars going in each direction. So that brings us to how you manage assets. And we have a, a model that is typically used that we at ARC Advisor Group don't like. And it's this model we feel is does not properly represent the iterative nature of improving an asset over time. It focuses too much on design and build. We offer a model that's more representative of the true business processes that occur, where you have a project, design and build project, handover, operate, maintain, you figure out ways to improve what's going on, then you have a portfolio of projects, some above the line get approved, get funded, and they become actual projects. And it's an iterative nature that, in the case of the Brooklyn Bridge, happened over 130 years, Brooklyn Bridge, for example, originally had gas lamps around the turn of the century, and I'm referring to the 1900s. Uh, from 1900, uh, yeah, around 1900, they converted to electricity, which uh, was a new invention at the time. And the primary purpose of using these business models is for business process management. Now, those of you in the audience who are familiar with asset management will say, well, you know, Ralph, this is intuitively obvious. Why are you telling me this? The main root user of this model are people like yourselves. So that when you communicate to someone who is not familiar with asset lifecycle management, you can help them understand the business processes. So if you're talking to somebody in IT, somebody in senior management, 
uh, this is a good communications tool for you to work with your peers. All right. So just to validate this process a little bit, this model, uh, I talk a little bit about the documentation and the users. You see that in each one of those circles, the documentation and the users are very different, which verifies that these are uh, true groups of uh, different groups of users and with different needs. Uh, and it should be used for business process management. Now within each circle, usually uh, there's someone leading that group who comes from that domain and understands the, the business processes and how to optimize it. However, uh, uh, between the circles, often there is a lot of waste and discontinuity. So we recommend that this model be used to really focus in on bridging the silos as you go through information management, what needs to be integrated, what should be the data flows, what should be the information flows. So you have the asset lifecycle information management. Think through what information is actually needed after handover uh, between design and build and handover. So you, you retain what's needed for the next project and then hand over what they need and operate and maintain for maintaining the equipment. And uh, we highly recommend a phase gate process for that where teams from both sides of the handover get involved in the transfer so it can be done in a rational and phased way and that the operate maintain people get the information they really need to maintain and operate the facility. All right, I'm going to switch gears over to survey results. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit dry. Uh, I, you know, it's after lunch. I'm nervous. You're going to fall asleep. I hope you had some coffee or tea to help you out there. Um, this was a survey we did in uh, collaboration with reliability.com. Uh, and uh, we got some very good responses. Uh, most of the responses, uh, two thirds of them were from the operating side of the world and the other came from either senior management or IT. And uh, in terms of the geographies, the, it was in English, so the English speaking uh, uh, geographies tend to dominate. Uh, Excuse me, one of the first questions is, why is ALIM, Asset Lifecycle Information Management, important? And when we do these surveys among uh, asset management people uh, in the domains of asset management, always uptime is on top. And, and I think it's important to remember the basics. We tend to get involved in our KPIs and uh, sometimes get distracted as they get more and more detailed. At a high level, the major KPI is uptime, and particularly reducing unplanned or unscheduled downtime. And then next is uh, typically is uh, asset longevity, and certainly this survey is consistent with other surveys we've done in the uh, domain area of asset lifecycle management. So the key KPIs is number one is uptime, it's always on top. R asset longevity is next. Then next usually is some cost containment, and then fourth is safety. Uh, the visibility one that's on here uh, is really a, a, a tool to manage those four so that uh, operating people and management know what's really going on. Now, uh, this particular one is uh, the question up here is, how is this integration achieved? So we asked a question about integrating applications. And I just need to explain the chart a little bit. The dark blue means they already have it. The lighter blue means that they have it in the next capital budget for the next year or in the uh, budget for improvement in the next year. Uh, usually, I'm going to interpret this. What this really means is they figured out what the financial benefits are. Now, the third, the lightest blue, blue is something that they plan to do in three years or so, within three years. And I'm going to interpret that for you. What that means is we know this is a problem. Uh, it's caused us a lot of consternation. But we haven't been able to figure out what the financial return is. And therefore, we can't get it into the, into the budget, budgeting process. 
All right, so uh, this, quite frankly, raises a lot of alarms because the primary means of application integration is manual. In the top one, they're using a spreadsheet, which means they're dumping data into a spreadsheet, manually rearranging the columns, and then uploading it into a, uh, the other application. Uh, that, that's better than the number two item, which is uh, uh, not very distant number two, is manual data entry, where they key punch it in one application, and then you key punch it again in another application. We all know that there's going to be data entry errors, and the two applications are going to be inconsistent and confusing. Both of these are ugly, to say the best, and it's a, just a difference between ugly and uglier. Uh, and in terms of a, a real integration from an IT viewpoint, uh, we see these things uh, falling much lower in the chart. So I, I put this one in here to just to basically state we have a problem. And the next one also reinforces that. If we talk about handover, this is how is data transferred and handover. It's all the first two by a long shot are manually. You know, just hand over boatload of documents or you know, I have a casual conversation with somebody and say, oh yeah, by the way, you may need this document type of thing. Uh, both are uh, 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 not very good. I mean, the top one, what we've, uh, the, the improvement that everybody's happy about is we've gone from uh, a truck with pallet loads of paper coming to the dock and being dumped into the operate and maintain side, that being handover. We've got really high tech. We put all these PDFs in a server, and we hand over the server. Well, it's a little bit better. I mean, you can search PDFs, but it's still ugly uh, because essentially there's still hard copy type documentation that's getting, getting transferred. So this is another uh, example of how the business processes among those three circles are essentially, for most applications, most customers, broken. Uh, and this one says basically that most people recognize it's a problem. Most people would like to put in management of change in some kind of automated IT type fa fashion. A lot of people say they have it, but if we look at the light yellow down here, you can see all those numbers are huge in comparison to the other charts. So the fundamental problem is People know they have a problem. They know that there is a solution out there. They can track in their head how to get to the solution. Unfortunately, they do not know how to financially justify it. Hence, the next part of this discussion. I'm going to attempt, at admittedly a little bit of a superficial level, to talk about how you connect asset lifecycle information management and also asset lifecycle management to the C-suite and get their interest. And I just want to say this, you know, we all have metrics and we react to our metrics. We try to achieve our metrics and do perform well against them. And we often, at least I used to early in my career, wonder how the heck are these C-suite guys, the president, CEO, and those measured? And it took me a while to realize their KPIs are very public. They're in the balance sheet and the P&L statement that are part of the annual report or the quarterly reports. So in fact, here's career advice for everybody in the room. Read your company's annual report. In particularly, the chairman's letter, it's usually a few pages in the front of the annual report, and almost always the key programs and the key interests of the C-suite are laid out in the chair chairman's level letter. And if you're working on something that doesn't fold into anything the chairman is interested in, consider a change of jobs, hopefully within the company you're in, but <laughs> you should consider a change of jobs. Okay, the, uh, the pre and L statement and the balance sheet, uh, they are certain financial ratios that are in there, and these ratios are what the 
financial analysts use to evaluate the value of the stock. So if you can affect the balance sheet in a P&L statement, you affect the value of the stock, and you make the C-suite very happy because they all have stock options, typically, or some stock ownership. This is kind of a little bit of a repeat reinforcement of the primary KPIs for asset lifecycle management, and now I'm going to relate them to the C-suite. So uptime. Uh, when there's downtime, particularly unscheduled downtime, then production doesn't have access to the equipment. That uh, interrupts their ability to make product. And as a result, you get uh, miss uh, uh, schedule to meet customer commitments, which turns into a customer satisfaction problem, which turns into a revenue problem. So the recommendation is to relate your asset lifecycle management uh, proposals to uptime and revenue. Now, that may be a little difficult to do, but I will tell you from personal experience, even if you come up with an estimate that's credible, it will get the C-suite's interest. And the other one up there is that if you have more uptime, you have more capacity, and therefore you don't need to, if, if your business is doing well, you don't need to add capacity. That conserves cash, which makes the CFO happy and makes ROI of the, the company better and therefore improves the value of the stock. Again, both are good things to do from the C-suite's perspective. I talked about asset longevity a little bit before, earlier today, but I'll just a quick repeat. If the asset lasts longer, it doesn't need to be replaced. That means they don't need to take cash and put it into assets. Cash conservation improves ROI, improves the stock value. Cost control lowers cost, improves margin, profitability, another good thing. <coughs> Safety is risk. You'll see in the annual report, there's always a section that talks about risk. And, uh, uh, you know, as part of governance of a corporation, uh, in the U.S. we have Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, part of governance of, cor a corp uh, governance of a corporation, risk assessment is very important. If you can take some of that off the table, that makes the C-suite happy. And quality, again, gets into a revenue improvement and uh, margin improvement situation. So the recommendation basically is, in your proposals, if you're struggling with figuring out how to do ROI and make the C-suite and CFO interested in your proposals, think through how you can relate it to the P&L statement and the balance sheet. And even if it's a little of a guesstimate, it'll be much better than not addressing that and vastly improve the probability that your proposals will get approved. Um, by the way, those of you who are in the public sector uh, and you don't have a P&L statement, a balance sheet, 